This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. Nadine Hack is the CEO of Because Global Consulting, a company focused on engagement leadership. Nadine has advised leaders of Fortune 500 companies and heads of state, and she was the first woman to serve as executive in residence at IMD Business School. Nadine has advanced degrees from Harvard and the New School and has received numerous awards, including International Outstanding Achievement, Woman of the Year, and Inspiration Award for Lifetime Achievement presented at the Said Business School at Oxford University. Nadine is a sought-after speaker for meetings and conferences and has had articles written about or published by her in the Financial Times, Forbes, Huffington Post, Rewiring Business, The New York Times, and UN Chronicle. I spoke with Nadine in Geneva, Switzerland. Hi, Nadine. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today. We really appreciate your time. You're an extremely busy person. Uh, let's start with getting a better picture of, of who you are and, and how you came to be where you are today. How, how did you evolve personally into Because.net? Well, I seem to be drawn toward bringing people together, and it's kind of what I've always done. It's, it's like breathing for me. When I meet most people, I immediately think about others who I can connect them to because I believe there would be a mutual synergy among them that would benefit all of them. So while I've worked in every sector, business, government, non-for-profit, and the UN, I really discovered that my unique strength was bringing together cross-sector partnerships for the mutual benefit of all of them, which I've been doing since the 1970s. And I since I formed Because Global Consulting, I've advised my clients who are executives from all the sectors on how to clarify and achieve their goals, but often with a focus on stakeholder engagement, both internally and externally. And it's what I call engagement leadership. You've teed me up. What exactly is engagement leadership? Is, is it a great name for networking or is there a specific thing that you do? Well... A Welsh proverb tells us he, and I would add, or she, who would be a leader must be a bridge. And what I call engagement leaders are indeed bridges, people who know how to connect different types of people for the benefit of each and all. They know that deeply engaging their internal and their external stakeholders in the co-creation of business changes and new initiatives is vital for any strategic action plan to be properly executed. I can't tell you the number of strategic plans I've seen sitting up on shelves gathering dust because nobody actually thought through how they were going to engage their stakeholders in executing those plans. So, um, you know, John Paul Sartre declared that hell is other people, but I think a good engagement leader actually finds heaven in other people. And, you know, to get a sense of what an engagement leader is, you could look at someone like Nelson Mandela, who is truly an archetypal engagement leader. After being imprisoned for 27 brutal years of imprisonment, he emerged as a fervent advocate of engaging with the very people and institutions that oppressed him and others in South Africa's movement for democracy. So when he was released in 1990, he then spent the next four years in negotiation with the stalwarts of the apartheid regime who had imprisoned him and others. And then as president, he continued to ensure that all faces and voices in his country were represented in government, business and other institutions in South Africa. So he helped people of disparate cultures and even some of whom had a, a history of violent enmity to see that only by engaging with the so-called enemy, something most of them had been previously totally unwilling to do, could any of them achieve their ambitious goals for a new South Africa? Now, of course, we can learn much from President Mandela, but it would be really defeatist to think that one has to be an extraordinary person like him to be a successful engagement leader, because the motivation for and the value of being an engagement leader in the 21st century and in 21st century business in particular should be one's personal desire to engage with others in order to play a key role in making a positive difference when challenges arise. And if there are people who have that desire, they're not alone and neither are the people who they want to engage with. 
because this is, there's this huge, rich body of research, not to mention eons of human experience, that shows that most people yearn for deeply engaged relationships with others, particularly in group endeavors, including all aspects of business. So in my mind, therefore, for any enterprise to be sustainable, its leaders must know how to foster relationships with many different types of people. I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to go off on a tangent here just for a second, sure. because you're speaking about connecting with others, building mm-hmm. relationships, engagement. How, in your opinion, has the social media technology either affected or, or eroded our ability to connect and engage with one another? I think it's one of the most exciting frontiers for me. I'm, I can't even tell you the level of excitement I have about social media. Um, it's very interesting because for a long time, up until just about a decade ago, or not even that long ago, I mean, up until about 2009, so we're really only saying maybe four or five years ago, mm-hmm. I used to tell my clients for like at least a decade prior to that, I used to tell my clients, oh, and you know, you really need to use social media in order to uh, magnify your your reach and here's where you can go to go learn about it. And then one day I woke up and I said, you know, Nadine, your whole life you've been a person who's really about walking the walk, not just talking the talk. And you can't be advising other people to do something that you don't do. And so I started, now remember, I'm in my 60s, so this does not come naturally to me. I'm not, I'm far from being a digital native. I really, really had to, to, to teach myself. And at first I was, you know, terrified by it. It was like, it just felt like, oh my God, I'm already so overwhelmed by the quantity of information that comes at me every single day and the, the quantity of things I need to deal with. How can I take on this whole huge mega world? Won't it just swallow me up? But I, I really pushed myself uh, with the urging of my younger colleagues in my business to start to experiment on various social network platforms. And as I did, I began to learn how much you can discover and connect with people from whom you can learn and and people who are happy about learning from you. Of course, there's a huge amount of garbage out there, but when you start to actually participate in these platforms, you learn really quickly how to um, kind of sift through the weed and the chaff, and you learn to ignore the people who are posting pictures of adorable cats and, you know, who are just retweeting, you know, their name over and over and their promotion. You, you learn to ignore those people or not, you know, take them off your list. And you can find extraordinary affinity groups. And beyond that, the thing that strikes me is that for anybody doing business today, and when I say business, I don't necessarily mean just restricted to corporate business. Uh, uh, it, it could be the business of a not-for-profit or the business of a government. I mean, it could any type of business. There's an entire generation who are both disseminating and aggregating their, what they know and what they share through these fora. And you are not really relevant if you don't understand how that's happening. I mean, how can I call myself a consultant if I don't understand and I'm not able to navigate through that world? So in these recent years, I've been taking what I learned about relationships and fostering relationships and building engaged relationships, what I learned in four decades of doing that in the non-virtual world and applying it in this, you know, incredible universe uh, and discovering people who I never would have found otherwise. And so I I feel just incredibly fortunate to Mm -hmm. be alive at this time when such a, uh, you know, extraordinary transformation is happening. Mm -hmm. I have to be honest, that is the most impassioned response I've ever received to that question. And there are some people who are very much on the other side of the court. Oh, I know. Uh, I mean, most people my age are completely dismissive of it. Like, oh, that that's for kids. I don't have time for that. And and I, I just feel sorry for them for what they're missing. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to engagement leadership. And, and you have 
coined a term or, or have a process that you practice called strategic relational engagement. This is a you know this is your sort of professional offering of of how to do engagement leadership. Tell mm-hmm. us about that process. How does that work either for you know a business leader or a nonprofit leader or as you say government leader? What's it sure. look like on a day to day basis? Well. It's always been the case, but it's only more so in the context of what you just asked me about in social media, that a broad spectrum of stakeholders has a very direct impact on every enterprise's core business, whether they like it or not. And in today's increasingly interconnected world, organizations that foster a deep level of connection with their stakeholders are more successful in shaping that impact to their greatest advantage. And this is what I call, this is why I call it strategic relational engagement or SRE, because adding the component of fostering meaningful relationships into business can transform stakeholder fear and or animosity into understanding, productivity, and strategic impact. And while SRE as a business strategy is an IP concept that I developed, It has a history of many precedents. I mean, there's several decades of a growing body of business literature that supports the values of team building, consensus building, and other relational activities to achieve strategic leadership and successful organizational change management. And interesting, you asked me earlier, you know, what was my genesis? I come from... 1960s student activism, civil rights time, and Dr. Martin Luther King had a very profound impact on my life. Dr. King wrote about achieving the beloved community. And it's a term that may seem touchy-feely to some, but his core belief was that increasing cooperation among allies and even winning the friendship of opponents would make it possible to live and work together productively. And I think this applies to business. King's idea then successfully launched an unprecedented measure of social change. But it and it was based on the finding the shared benefit through respect and concern born of cooperative relationship and by bridging the gap between even those with opposing views so that consensus could be reached so that every party might gain something while the broader society also benefited. And for companies today, this has become what's called the the coveted triple bottom line, people, planet, profit. So thus, from whether you look at it from a philosophical point of view or a practical perspective, Embracing SRE, strategic relational engagement, I believe is a necessary component of doing business successfully in the 21st century. That's fantastic. Is there a particular skill set or other resources that a company or a leader needs in order to successfully practice SRE? Is it training? Is it money? Is it time? It's, it will, well, let's start first with business leaders' assumptions or often what might be their prejudices about the capacities or even the validity of their stakeholders, whether these are stakeholders inside or outside of their company. It's my premise that those assumptions slash prejudices weaken those leaders' ability to make wise decisions. And when they can rise above such bias, and engage more of their stakeholders effectively, they strengthen their decision-making talent and their leadership status. It may sound counterintuitive to those who believe that their status comes from fiercely protecting their control and their territorial power, but my experience over four decades shows that the opposite is true. In fact, the more inclusive the style of leadership, the greater the success the company achieves. And You know, sadly, not many leaders accomplish this understanding, but those who do benefit tremendously. This relational connection to stakeholders results in much stronger engagement on everybody's part and thus greater productivity, greater profitability, greater sustainability for the company as a whole. So, yeah, there are concrete mechanisms. And when executives can learn and embrace the vital mechanisms of of relationship building, businesses can sustain 
SRE, Strategic Relational Engagement, and more assuredly solidified their Mm long-term success. And and by the way, in doing so, they become engagement leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, so what I've done is I've broken SRE into a process, this whole process into three main pillars. The first one is creating value through it. The second one is overcoming obstacles to it. And the third one is sustaining it for the long term. And, and creative leaders with foresight understand the strategy of engaging their stakeholders as a key driver. But with a lack of experience in this area, they sometimes fail to implement the full range of policies, practices, and behaviors available to achieve and sustain this goal. So let me just focus on creating value. Mm-hmm. So to create value through strategic relational engagement, leaders must understand three areas. What capabilities they already have and which they need to acquire is one. What conditions must be created or eliminated and which processes will move them forward. And when they can make an honest, straightforward assessment of their company's SRE capabilities, conditions, and processes, it allows them to properly evaluate the strengths, the weaknesses, and even the untapped resources. And it's great ideas and insightful observations really can come from the most unexpected sources. So when they begin to create SRE within their company and they invite their managers and their teams to do the same at each level of operation uh, so that internal stakeholders, regardless of their rank or duties, feel respected and appreciated, their company will be the beneficiary of their collective engagement. Can you give us a, a, a concrete example of an individual who, uh, or, or a company that was able to use these skills or, or positively affect, you know, their, their, could I first just give you a little bit more of, of an outline of some of these, these capacities. Absolutely. It, because engagement leaders for me are the prototype for 21st century business people. And they have the skills and temperaments ideal for doing business effectively. And, you know, again, hearkening back to what you asked me about social media, it's not just social media. In this age of globalization, everything is so interconnected. The, the lines are blurring between industries. The lines are blurring between industry and government. They're, and, and to be successful in today's world where these diverse stakeholder boundaries expand and change daily and and exponentially to no short degree because of social media that you brought up. It's really imperative to build and strengthen relationships. And so again, I've mapped out key three key areas for leaders to gain and increase engagement buy-in from three key types of stakeholder groups. The first are internal stakeholders, you know, and like the board, the management, the employees. The second are kind of willing external stakeholders like customers, suppliers, partners, organizations pursuing the same goal by differing methods. And the third is even potentially adversarial stakeholders, i.e., you know, regulators, watchdog groups, shareholders. So so let's focus just, just on one of those, like the internal stakeholders. Okay, yeah, I was I was even going to suggest as well the, yeah, the yeah. adversarial <laughs> ones because that's obviously where most well, people... Well, what if I exa- when I, 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 can, I can go into that too. I can tell you an adversarial story and I will. Oh, great. But, but it's interesting, I think, to begin. I, I always think... I'm, I'm a very holistic thinker and I see things interconnected and I tend to see things in concentric circles. So I see the internal stakeholders as the core and, and that if you don't build a solid core, it's really hard to build out to those, you know, further out, uh, concentric circles. So while most leaders usually have a pretty explicit framework, if not multiple frameworks, for the internal processes, they usually don't have, shockingly, they usually don't have a clear engagement action plan. Or, at the worst end of the spectrum, they even avoid engagement. I mean, 
so many of us have worked in environments where the person at the top or even the entire senior management team for that matter is fearful of anything other than policies or procedures that they themselves put in place. In fact, that person, the person might be you, <laughs> whoever's listening to me as the head of a particular business line, region, or even an entire company. And in, in typical command and control mode, they or you simply do not take advantage of any opportunities that don't originate with them or you. But if you don't fall in that category, then let's look at how you might introduce or be introduced to new and better ways of engaging. And there's some key fundamentals. And relationships and trust are absolutely foundational. And so this requires building trust with your key stakeholders, which usually turns on something so simple and yet so profound which is listening to them and incorporating their input. Then you can expand, ex engage relationships throughout your organization through chains of trust from one person to the next as you model that behavior of listening and incorporating. And, and it, this requires using emotional intelligence to, to knowing where people are in their professional trajectory. It means being sensitive to those who stratus is changing, whether it's up or down or laterally, and even being alert to how they perceive their current position in the organization, even if it's remaining the same. And, and further, you can't just do this as an in individual initiative. You somehow have to create structural support within your organization that has to be woven into the fabric of how your company operates internally. And to, to do this, you really have to develop systematic mechanisms that value and reward stakeholder collaboration. And, you know, for example, if you have global offshoots, this is particularly important to help them understand, buy in, and support change. So I've helped many organizations do these steps by creating a stakeholder roadmap, beginning to work on them, beginning to engage their stakeholders, and then make the proper course corrections as they engage and learn what's best for them. What's a, can you give us an example of a reward that you would consider for stakeholder engagement? Well, here's the thing. Think about today's companies. There's barely a company on earth that does not have either a vision statement, a mission statement, or some combination of the two that says in paper and proudly proclaims on their website, on their brochures, and in every other, you know, pitch that they give that, you know, we value our employees. We value the environment. We value things other than profit. And when it comes down to the annual bonus, what are people being compensated on? Too often, sadly, only their financial results. So take even the most well-intentioned employee, you know, a really good person who really cares about bigger picture things in society and the world and really would want to do the right thing. And on the one hand, they've got this mission statement. And on the other hand, They've got the check they're going to get, which is going to support their family and put their kids through school. And it's pretty much a no-brainer which way the majority of people are going to go. So when I say reward, I mean very concretely reward, like put that into the equation of the benefits package. You were going to also give us an example of engaging with adversarial stakeholders or the, the third concentric circle. Oh, yeah, sure. So I, I gave a TED Talk in Geneva earlier this year called Adversaries to Allies. And I used an example from over 35 years ago, which I chose because the connections that were formed then in the 1970s still are yielding amazing results today. And if anyone's interested in hearing that, they can simply search Nadine Hack TEDx and the YouTube video will pop up or Alternatively, you can just find it on my website, because.net. But to give you the gist of that story, essentially four groups who at that time were bitterly antagonistic, government leaders, community organizers, environmental activists, and the logging industry. 
Now, remember, this is the 1970s, so people were chaining themselves to trees, just to give you the context. And we were able to bring them together on a sustainability initiative long before the term renewable resource was in the common lexicon. So how was that possible? First, we helped them be absolutely clear on how they'd each benefit. And then we had to remind each stakeholder multiple times iteratively to refocus on the clarity of why they chose to engage. So the lesson from that and many other successful examples since then is that you really have to be clear on exactly what you're willing to give and exactly what you anticipate you'll receive. This seems so obvious, but I can't even tell you the number of times I've seen collaborations fail, even among willing, leave alone adversarials, but even among willing partners, collaborations fail because people simply weren't really clear with each other or necessarily even with themselves about their expectation. So in this situation, when we were working with these four different groups, it was critical to mobilize those players within each sector who had the ability to go beyond their own narrow territorial position and, and see a bigger picture. Because there's always going to be those who protect their fiefdom at all costs. And they're not going to help you form engaged relationships. In fact, they'll probably fight you at every step. So whether it's just within a business unit itself, you, you know, you can have people who are sitting in cubby holes side by side and they're actually fighting each other or trying to undermine each other. Whether it's within a business unit or between several lines or, or even among many different entities, find those who are willing to engage despite the difficulties because they're absolutely out there. As I said earlier, there's this enormous amount of research about how much people really yearn to connect. So look for those who have some capacity to engage and then make it as easy as possible for them. And remember, engagement, it's its not a one-shot deal. You have to continually offer ongoing nourishing. Not, none of it happens overnight. Bringing together loggers with environmentalists, with government legislators, with community activists was, was not something that just spontaneously happened. It, you have to bring them together. And, and, and for me, what's really, truly most interesting about that particular coalition and, and many others that I've worked on since is that beyond all the logic-based benefits, of which there were many, I mean, they all ended up winning. You know, the, the logging company, by changing their practices and planting two trees for every one tree they cut down, extended their sustainability in business and the, you know, every single player got something out of it. But really what made it possible was their basic shared humanity. And, and so bringing people together so that they can experience each other as other human beings. And this is where the fundamental insights of people like King and Mandela play out in our everyday lives because former arch enemies had to actually experience that they had more in common with each other than they thought, which which made it possible for them to even consider the possibility of working with each other, even though they came from a different vantage point. One of the things that we always seem to, you know, we're really good at telling successes. Yeah. Just as a human species, right? We want to talk about successes. <laughs> Tell me about when SRE or, or engagement leadership or one of these processes has fallen on its face. What happened? Yeah. So, so in these decades, since that 1970s success story, I, I've been able to repeat what we achieved there in situations as diverse as helping Coca-Cola Africa work with the very HIV AIDS groups that were protesting against them and with governments throughout Africa to change their policies and procedures on uh, prevention, protection, testing, and treatment for HIV AIDS. And, and that's a really big accomplishment. Coca-Cola Africa is the biggest employer on the continent. So that's a major thing. But I have to say I've learned as much, if not more, from my failures. Because you see, it underscores all the points that I've been talking to you about. I've learned them as much from my failures as I've learned them from my successes. For example, we had a really totally well-intentioned public-private consortium that formed 
to deal with child nutrition in India. And all of the key players, Unilever was the key corporate player, UNICEF was the key UN agency, the government of Maharashtra state was the key player in India, a global NGO called the Synergos Institute. And then there were myriad other people involved in the consortium, India-based companies like the Tata Group and myriad Indian-based NGOs and government agencies. They all shared the same value of wanting to reduce child nutrition. and But they never quite achieved clarity on exactly what they hoped to do. They never fully came to trust each other's motivations. And they had great difficulty in keeping the alliance intact. And ultimately, it broke down. And they turned it over to a local group to continue the work under the same name as they'd hoped to share as this big group called the ba, uh, Bavisha Alliance. And, and this group does great, great, wonderfully valuable work, but it's, it's a local organization doing local work in India. And the sad part was that the ambition of scale that this Unilever, UNICEF, Government of India coalition envisioned was possible not only in that one state, but they actually hoped after piloting seven rural sites and seven urban sites to roll it up throughout India. And actually, because these, the, the founders were global players, they hoped then India would become a template for rolling it out globally. And they just could never even achieve it in their pilot projects because a lack of strategic relational engagement success. And did that that lack of strategical engagement was was it because you were I'm lucky enough to have also worked in those those same arenas did you feel it was a bureaucratic issue did you feel it was you know you were dealing with sort of the leaders who felt like this is you know this this engagement was you know this is something that the underlings do or where where did that that missing piece well to some degree I think your point about leadership is is on point because they never gained clarity at the very jump start of why are we doing this and because they didn't memorialize that in even a basic kind of um mou that they all signed off on every time there was a change in leadership like the new people coming in to take over the role of the person who had held that role before didn't necessarily buy into what they were looking for to, to achieve. So yes, there's a leadership component, but it, it really, um, I think this point, I keep coming back to it. I know it, 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 it seems too obvious to dwell on, but being really clear is so vital. I mean, not just in partnerships, just, just in anything you do. This is, I, I found this to be true in general in life. Being really clear about exactly what you hope to achieve is a really, in my mind, big missing step for a lot of people. And you know that famous uh, Alice in Wonderland place where, you know, she she reaches the point and she comes to the wall and the Mad Hatter sitting on top of it and she says, it, you know, it's a T in the, in the in the road, and she has to go le- right or left. And she says to him, which way do I go? And he says, well, where are you going? And she says, I don't know. And then he says, well, then it doesn't matter, does it? I mean, I'm paraphrasing. That's not the exact language of Lewis and Carroll. But the concept is when you don't know and you haven't clarified for yourself and you haven't clarified for those you're trying to engage, whether they're within your organization, outside your organization, they're an ally, they're an adversary, whatever they are, if you don't know and you're not explicitly clear, the chances of you achieving it are very, very slim. And the chance of you measuring it, the chance of you get feeling a sense of small victories that, that give you the confidence to keep moving forward, That that's what was so great about the urban reforestation and which ultimately became statewide reforestation, which ultimately became a statewide renewable resource uh, initiative and statewide legislation, which became um, the blueprint for global green plans. It At each iteration, as people experience small successes, they then have the confidence to take it to the next step. 
I, I am an extraordinary advocate for the clarity of vision and the clarity of purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think that your your words are, are are falling on deaf ears. I'm hoping not within this within this uh, this listenership. I I know your time is valuable. We we've uh, you know you've shared some incredible insights. One one last question. Sure. The, the people listening to this uh, or our audience is is a uh, an audience of young leaders, new leaders, mid level managers. Um, who are, you know, sort of still finding their way. Some people have got their vision and, and they're, they're moving forward. What advice would you give to a new leader, you know, a new MBA or maybe somebody who's been out of an MBA for a couple of years, uh, how to create this engagement leadership in their life, how to bring SRE into their personal practice in a real way? In a real way, I would say regardless of what level you currently are at, it really doesn't matter whether you're like, at the entry level position or you're, you've already achieved a C-suite level position. Try to be as open as you can to the people who are around you because no one person, not yourself or anyone else, even someone who you consider your mentor, holds all the knowledge. Knowledge is held by many people Knowledge can be held by people who are younger than you, less experienced than you. Knowledge can be held by the intern who's doing a summer internship with you. And the more that you can kind of put yourself in that position, you know, I guess it's humility to recognize that you always can learn and that when you learn and or you teach because these are the two sides of the equation. Whenever you share knowledge, nobody loses. Like I, I, I often describe the difference between a physical thing and knowledge. Like if I'm holding a physical pen, I'm holding a physical pen in my hand right now. If I could reach through the, the radio waves and hand it to you, you would have the pen and I would no longer have the pen. But when you share knowledge with me or I share knowledge with you, I still have it, you still have it. Nobody has been diminished by that exchange. We've both been enhanced by that exchange. Similarly, I mean, people are sometimes very territorial, not only about their knowledge, their context. They think, oh my God, if I introduce Stephen to someone else who I know, then that will diminish my, then, you know, I no longer have the power that Stephen has to come through me. No, it's a big world. There's a lot of things to be done. Stephen, I can give you, Stephen, a relationship with someone I know that helps benefit you that doesn't in any way diminish my relationship with that person and what that person and I can achieve together. And it just creates ripples of better things happening by more people. And so you never lose by giving and receiving. It, it, again, it, it sounds ridiculously simple, but it requires a profound shift from the way our culture has trained people to think about power and about authority. And, and I think it's, I think it's such a profound shift. And it's it's not hard to do, but it is hard to do. Nadine, thank you so very much for your time today. Sure. I really do hope if, as a result of this interview, a couple of people become more open and more engaging, then I feel like I've done a good thing today. Great. Thanks again. Lovely to talk to you, Stephen. You've been listening to Terms of Reference, a weekly podcast from aidpreneur.com. Find us on iTunes or at www.aidpreneur.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time.